gospel reading this morning comes from the book of Matthew. If you are looking in our pew Bibles, it is in the New Testament section at the very beginning on page 16. So join with me as I read Matthew 14, verses 22 through 33. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. After he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came, walking towards them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost, and they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now every single week we gather here to worship, to sing, to pray, to listen to the Bible being read, and to hear a sermon. And for some of you in this room this morning, this might be the first sermon you have ever heard. But what is a sermon? Besides a chance for me to just talk and hope that something that come out of my mouth made a difference to you, a sermon should be a chance to listen to the scriptures, to listen to what God is saying to us right now through the stories and the songs and the lessons of those that came before us, to ask ourselves what this book is saying and what God is trying to say to us through it. Today we've invited our children to see and hear and experience what we do in this room. What draws us to this place? And I am glad to have you. I really am. Today we gave Bibles to our first graders to show them that this book is more than a book. That it matters. And I will tell you, a lot of people are scared of the Bible. They are intimidated by it. It is a big book. And you see just how big this one is. People think that they don't know how to read it. They don't know how to understand it. And I want to share with you right now from the pulpit that there is no wrong way to read the Bible as long as you are really, really reading it. I believe that God can and does speak through every word in this book if we let him. So this morning, I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm not just going to share with you what I feel that God is saying to us through this story, but I want to share with you how I hear the story, how I read the Bible. Now, it's not the only way to read the Bible, and it may not be the best way, but it helps me as I seek to figure out what God is not only saying to me, but is asking me to share with you each week. I read the Bible asking myself what the people in the stories thought about what was happening to them. I like to imagine that if I was to invite somebody from one of those Bible stories to my house one night and sat them down at my dinner table and asked them what they remember, what they might tell me. When I study the scripture, it's to put together the pieces of a puzzle so that I can hear how they might answer. So this morning, I want you to hear how I feel Peter might have answered if he sat down at my dinner table and I asked him what he remembered about the time that he walked on water with Jesus. Do I remember that night? Of course I remember that night. I've played it and replayed it in my head every day since it happened. Sometimes I see it in my dreams. I remember the waves and I remember the wind. But what I remember the most was how afraid I was. 
I have never been that scared in my life. And the fear that I felt seemed to come out of nowhere. I had just seen Jesus perform a miracle. The last thing I thought was that I was going to be that afraid moments after. I just watched Jesus feed 5,000 men and no telling how many women and how many children using nothing but a couple of fish and a few loaves of bread. There were so many people and somehow, somehow Jesus was able to make that bread last to make that fish last. Somehow he was able to multiply that food to a point that we had an all-you-could-eat, family-style buffet right there overlooking the lake, and there were leftovers. I know because I was charged with going to pick up the leftovers, to put them into baskets. I remember being amazed, but I also remember being proud. Proud that I had chosen to follow a man that could heal the sick, that could cure the blind and give them sight and that could do something like that. I remember the faces of the people as I walked up with my basket so they could put their leftovers inside and they looked at me as somebody important because I was with him, because I was with Jesus, because of all the people in the whole world, he chose me, chose me to be one of his disciples. I have never been so proud to hold a basket of already half-chewed fish and bread in my life. It might as well have been a basket of diamonds and gold. And as I held that basket of fish, I couldn't help but remember the moment that Jesus found me. The day he jumped in my fishing boat and showed me where to fish. I had been out all night and I caught nothing. But somehow Jesus, a man I had never seen before, was able to catch so many fish that my nets began to break. So many fish that I had to call out for other boats to help us as we tried to pull them into our boat. So many fish that if I sat and looked at them in the net, there's no question it could have fed 5,000 people. That day was the last time that I went fishing. Peter. Drop your nets. That's what he said to me. Drop your nets and follow me. For now on, we will be catching people. And so I did. I dropped my nets. I left my family. I left my life. And I followed. That was also the first time that Jesus told me not to be afraid. The day that I believed that as long as he was with me, the fear wasn't possible. I had no idea. As I walked among the crowds gathering scraps of fish and bread, that that belief would soon be put to the test. That I would soon, soon stare fear in the face, even as I looked at the face of Jesus. And it started with one word. Go. Go on, Jesus said. Go on, Get back in the boat and go ahead of me to the other side of the lake. I stood there holding my basket of bread and fish and I listened to this. He said, I need to go and pray alone. I'll meet you once you get there. Guys, get in the boat and go across. His words terrified me. You got to understand, in all the time that I'd spent with Jesus, this was the first time that he ever told me or any of us to leave him alone. I hadn't left his side since the day he jumped in my fishing boat, since I became a disciple. Everywhere I, he went, I went. Everywhere he ate, I ate. When he healed somebody, when he cured a disease, when he preached about God, I was there until that night, until he made us get in that boat and leave him behind. I remember watching him as the boat pulled away. I remember watching him as he dispersed the crowds. I remember watching him as he left by himself to climb the mountain and pray alone. And I watched him as we pulled farther and farther away from shore and he faded in the distance. I was in a boat with 11 of my closest friends and brothers. And for the first time in all of our time together, I felt alone. 
Jesus was Emmanuel. It was a name that meant God with us, and now he wasn't. I was alone, and I was scared as we paddled away from him because he told us to. And that fear only grew as the sun set in the horizon and the stars began to be blotted out by clouds that were so dark that you couldn't tell where they ended and where the night sky began. I've been a fisherman all my life. I'd spend most of the days and nights of my childhood on a boat just like that one on that same lake. It was not an uncommon occurrence for there to be a storm on the sea. This happened all the time. Storms were known to come quickly and furiously and without warning on the Sea of Galilee. And I felt the sting of the waves hammering against the side of the boat the same way I always had. I knew what it was like to struggle against strong winds that seemed to whistle through the ropes as they were tied around the mast trying to get them to untie. Unlike some of the other disciples who got on that boat, some of them were doctors. Some of them, one of them was a tax collector before he followed Jesus. They didn't know. They didn't know like I did what it was like to stand up and sail through a storm. I'd stay, sailed through more storms than I could count. And I will tell you that I was still afraid. Not because of the waves or the wind. But because for the first time these familiar things did not feel like a part of nature anymore. They felt like they were attacking us. That they were attacking me. Punishing us for leaving Jesus behind. That night the wind didn't feel like wind. It felt like the hot breath of some ancient sea monster trying hungrily to pull us into its mouth. That night the waves didn't feel like waves, but like these monstrous claws battering against the wood, trying to break the boat apart from beneath us. We rode for hours, shouting at each other over the thunder that surrounded us. And I began to ask myself why. Why had Jesus asked us to leave? Why did the one person who could help us send us out there alone? Why, after seeing such a miracle as the feeding of all of those people, were we destined to drown together in the lake? I could hear some of the others trying to reassure one another, trying to give each other hope. I don't blame them. Keep rowing, they said. We're almost there. We've got to be getting close, they said. They yelled and yelled as the water erupted on the sides of the boat. But I knew. I knew I'd fish that lake every night. I knew exactly where we were. And we were miles from the shore. I was afraid. I was soaked to the bone with both seawater and fear. And I didn't think I'd ever be more afraid than I was in that moment. And I was wrong. Because that's when we saw it. Coming up out of the stern of the boat. A barely visible figure in the distance. In the moonlight, the scarce moonlight reflecting off the churning water, we could see a man walking on the waves, walking as they billowed and rolled, moving up and down with the surf. It's a ghost, somebody screamed. And he's vocalizing what we were all thinking. We didn't know what to do. I mean, what could we do? If we stopped rowing, the wind would just push us towards this figure, towards this ghost. And if we kept rowing, it's not like we were going to get away faster than this water man was walking. We had been rowing against that wind all night. If we were going to get to the shore, we would have done so already. It was only a matter of time before he would be upon us. And so all we could do was sit frozen in fear and wait. And scream. We could scream also. And, and we did that a lot. And maybe it was the screaming that he heard because that's when he spoke. Take heart, have courage, do not be afraid. I am with you. They were the same words that Jesus had spoken to me the day I became a disciple. The day I dropped my nets. And for a moment, it even sounded like his voice. 
echoing above the roaring sea. Could it be true? The question lingered in my heart. Is this really Jesus? Or is this some kind of terrible trick? I looked at the other disciples and I knew they heard what I heard. I could see it all over their faces. And I looked for some sign of hope on their faces. And they just stood there frozen. I had to know. I had to know if this was Jesus. And so I thought of the only way that I could find out. I yelled out the back of the boat, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. I still couldn't make out his face, but I heard him speak very clearly. A single word, come. Where there was only fear, joy now reigned in my heart. Overwhelming and indescribable joy. I didn't think, I didn't wait, while my brothers clung to the side of the boat so tight they were putting splinters in their fingertips, I just threw my legs over the side. I stepped out on the very waves that moments before I knew wanted my life. I walked out to the place that I was most afraid of. And the instant that my feet touched the water, that I let go of the side of that boat, everything that I thought I knew shattered. I could feel my body rising and falling with the sea, just ha as it had in the boat, except now there was no boat. There was only me, only my Jesus, only the churning sea that obeyed his command. I had spent hours fighting against the water, running in fear of its anger and its wrath, and now I was trampling all over its face as I walked toward my Jesus, toward my Savior as he walked toward me. People keep asking me what it feels like to walk on water. If you're a fisherman, you know what it feels like. It feels like standing on the deck, going up and down with the tide. It feels like standing on something that is beyond yours to control, but standing just the same. You can still feel the water coming up on your feet, licking your ankles. There's no question about that. But still you stand. It's just like that. Except there's no boat. And there's no deck. And you don't leave any footprints. Your feet are planted on faith. On God. On the very being who is always defied what I thought was possible on the only thing in the universe that has walked on water before. I would love to tell you that what your heart is feeling that moment that you're walking on water cancels out what your mind is telling you is possible. But you've already heard what happened to me and you know that that's not true. As I drew closer to Jesus walking on the waves at the point where I could almost reach out and touch him. I felt the same wind that threatened me before, and with it came that same fear. You can't do this. A voice from deep inside me called out in my head. A voice that seemed to come from the ancient heart of the chaotic sea itself. You know, Peter, that this isn't real. You know, Peter, that you are not worthy of this gift. You know that you are not good enough. You are a sinful man, Peter. You have always been a sinful man. And sinful men don't float. All night you have sought to save yourself from the wind and the waves, and you know, you know deep down that you can't. My joy shifted to doubt as the sea crept in to claim me. I could feel the water climbing up my legs, and so I reached out for Jesus' hand, only to see it getting farther and farther from mine as I slowly sank beneath the churning water. Lord, save me! Save me! I cried. Words that seemed to be swallowed by the wind, just as the water was swallowing me. Words 
that echoed a psalm I had heard since I was a child. A psalm that everybody who's a sailor, everybody that's a fisherman, everyone that's a mariner knows. Psalm 69, save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink deep in mire where there is no foothold. I have come into the deep waters and the floods sweep over me. I am weary from crying. My throat is parched. My eyes grow dim with waiting on my God. But before the sea could finally claim me, a hand, Jesus' strong hand, the same hand that helped me pull in all those fish, the same hand that fed all those people, took hold of me and pulled me back from the brink of chaos, pulled me back from the mouth of the raging, hungry waters. That same hand announced to the monsters of the sea that they would go hungry that night. And though I was elated that I was saved, when I looked at Jesus' eyes, I could see his disappointment. You have little faith, he asked. Why did you doubt? I had no answer. I still have no answer. Because in a single moment, I witnessed the power of God and the weakness of my own heart. I held tight to Jesus as we walked along the surf back to the boat in silence. I wasn't going to let go. Not again. Not ever again. No matter what. When Jesus' feet touched the deck, when he pulled himself into the boat, I'll never forget what happened. That instant, the wind stopped its howling and everything went quiet. The waves that had battered the sides of our boat laid down flat. What was once a churning black mass of water now was as still as glass, reflecting the stars above our heads so clearly that it looked like we were sailing on the heavens themselves. The others and I just looked at Jesus, stared at Jesus. We saw what happened. And as the sun began to rise over the water that morning, we did something we'd never done before. We had taught together, we had learned together, we had healed together, we had walked together with Jesus. But for the first time on that boat, me and all of those disciples turned to Jesus, our teacher, our leader, and we worshipped him as our God because we saw for the first time that he truly was God's son. When I hear the scriptures like that, it is hard for me not to see myself within the pages of the Bible. When I read about Peter's fear, about all the disciples' fear as they sat in the boat getting beat up by the wind and the waves, I see all the times I've been afraid, all the times that I felt like God was far away from me, all the times that I felt lost and alone. The moments where I read Peter get out of that boat and walk on water, I see the moments where I've been a part of the wonderful things that God has done. The moments that the power of God is the most real to me. When I read about Peter starting to sink because he was doubting, I think about all the times that I've started out with courage and somehow that went away. Like when I bungee jumped and when I skydived. You start out with a lot of courage when you jump out of an airplane. It disappears in the air. I will tell you that. When I read the moment that Peter feels his hand, or the hand of Jesus, pull him up after he's sinking. That's the moment that speaks to me the most. Because it makes me think of all the times that Jesus has brought me back. Even when the problems that I was facing were my own fault. Jesus knows that Peter's afraid. He knows that Peter is doubting. And he saves him anyway. Right in the nick of time. And all because Peter was willing to ask for help. Willing to admit that he could not do this on his own. Willing to say out loud that he needed to be saved by Jesus. When I read the Bible, God speaks to me sometimes and shows me things in my life that I'd forgotten about. When I read this story and read how Peter looked at Jesus and said, save me. 
I remember this time when I was a lifeguard, when I had to save somebody, and it was the weirdest water rescue I have ever heard of, and also the easiest. I'm sitting on the lifeguard stand, and I'm watching all of these kids swimming. I worked at a summer camp for kids with special needs, and they're swimming, and I'm making sure they're safe, and I'm making sure they're not running, and suddenly I hear this voice call out to me, lifeguard. I looked down and I saw this boy, he must have been eight or nine years old. I said, yes. He says, lifeguard, I thought that I could swim when I came over here and uh, it turns out I can't. So I'm going to need you to jump in here and save me. And with that, this boy, very calmly he said this, with that he just sank like a stone. And so, of course, I obliged his request. I blew the whistle. I jumped in. I brought him back to the deck. And I recognized something. That this boy, this boy was like Peter. He got into that same situation. He said he knew it was his fault. He even said so. I thought I could swim, so I came over here. But he also recognized his need to be saved. He was willing to admit that he needed help. And because of that, Help came right in the nick of time, in the moment that he needed it most. That's what I hope for each of us as we hear this story this morning. That we find ourselves in the scripture. That it reminds us of the stories of our lives. That when we come to worship, we come ready to not just hear a story from scripture, but to hear how God is calling us to live from within that story. In the case of Peter, may we find ourselves willing to walk to Christ when we're afraid. May we find ourselves willing to get out of the boat even if nobody else is going to. When we fail, may we find ourselves willing to admit to Christ that we need saving, that we need Jesus to save us. And when we recognize just who Jesus is, when we look at his face and cannot help but see the face of God, that in that moment, we worship together. Amen. As we leave this place, and it's the same as my hope every Sunday, as we walk out of church to a world still filled with wind, still filled with waves, that we do so willing to recognize the hand of Christ reaching out to us, and that we do so willing to reach that same hand out to others. May you go in peace to love and serve the Lord Amen.